man, how great is it that we can gather together as a family, worship, get around God's word together? I don't know about you, but for me, man, it's awesome, life-giving, just breathes life right into me. Those of you on our uh, online family, we're glad you're with us today, too, tuning in, maybe it's Facebook, YouTube, however you're tuning in. We're glad you're with us, and we do want to invite you to just connect with the host. If you're on Facebook, just say, hey, I'm here. If you have a prayer request or maybe a question as we go through a message, feel free to just let us know because we would love to interact with you and help you on your journey in any way. Now, we're pretty excited about moving through this book of Nehemiah because we've been learning how God can rebuild better than ever before. And today, we're going to be talking about being rebuilt by the Bible being rebuilt by the Bible. So if you have a Bible, turn to Nehemiah chapter 8. We've made our way all the way to chapter 8. Or if maybe your Bible's on your smartphone, turn on your Bible and make your way over to Nehemiah chapter 8. And I'll meet you there in just a moment. Now, let me see your hand if you've ever built something before. You ever built something before? Maybe like an Ikea desk or an item, and you, you got the directions laid out, and you're like, ah. so I used to have hair before I started trying to build items from Ikea. Maybe you built a bicycle or a toy for your child, you try to build it, or maybe just playing games, your erector set, Lego, whatever. You built something before, then you know that building is not easy. In 1628, crowd gathered, crowds gathered in Sweden's Stockholm Harbor to witness the maiden voyage of the Royal Swedish Navy's newest weapon. We're going to put it up on the screen. It was called the Vasa Warship. The Vasa Warship. It was armed with 64 bronze cannons. It was the most expensive, most powerful warship in the world at that time. Well... Excitement turned to shock as the Vasa warship, as it got just about a mile away from shore, began to tip back and forth and then tip to its side and sunk in full view of the onlooking crowds. Friends, this was a national tragedy. 53 lives were lost, and Sweden's war effort against Poland was significantly set back. So here's the question. What caused the Vasa warship to sink. Well, it was in 1961, 333 years later, that they raised the Vasa warship and it was examined by experts. And they discovered that the ship was asymmetrical. It was thicker on the port side than the starboard side. How can this be? Well, archaeologists also found four rulers used by the workmen who built the ship. Two of the rulers were calibrated to the Swedish foot, which is exactly 12 inches, and two of the rulers were calibrated to the Amsterdam foot, which was about 11 inches. In other words, the ship was built using two different and incompatible standards of measurement, and thus the ship was doomed from the start. It was a tragedy, literally, in the making. Let me ask you, what do you need God to build in your life? Or do you need God to rebuild in your life? For some of you, it's like, man, my mental health, this whole COVID thing has just destroyed my inner world. Maybe some of you would be my faith. You know, I used to read the Bible, pray, be close to God, serve him, be around his family, not so much. Or maybe some of you, it's relationships. I need God to rebuild my relationships. You know, friendships have just changed significantly. Or maybe within your family, it could be even be in your own marriage. Some of you, might, it might be a recovery. You were one day at a time, and now every day is day one all over again. Here's the reality, friends. Every single day, you and I, we're building something with our lives. Every single day. And here's the truth. You can't build a life that lasts on two different and incompatible standards of measurement. Either we build our lives on God's word, or we build our lives on what's going on in our culture around us and the stuff that just happens around. We can't mix the two together in some combination as though that's just going to be okay because if we do, listen, we are a tragedy in the making. So what if, where do we be, go from there? Well, let's look at our big idea for today. Here, here's the big idea. God uses his word to build and rebuild his people. What does God use? What's his standard? It's, it's his word. He uses his word to build and to rebuild his people. And everybody help me out nice and loud, true or false. The Bible is a famous book, true or false. 
True, super famous, like the most famous book ever. In fact, it's the best-selling book ever written. There's six billion copies floating around out there. The Bible is also the most translated book ever. There are 400 world languages where the entire Bible has been translated. Even the New Testament is translated into 2,500 languages. Surveys show that 92% of Americans own at least one copy of the Bible. The average American owns three. So let me see your hand if you own at least one Bible. Raise your hand. Keep it up if you own two Bibles. Keep it up if you own three. Keep it up if you own more than three. <laughs> we all have Bibles. Bibles are everywhere. It's not, not a problem with do we have them. They're all over the place. Now, here's some good news. Studies show that 83% of Americans say the Bible is important to their lives. Awesome. That's good news. 83%. It's important. Here's the not so good news. Only 19% of churchgoers read it every day. Read it every day. Don't, 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 don't. Read it every day. Don't, 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 don't. Read it every day. Don't, don't, don't. Don't. So the result is that people often quote verses that they think are in the Bible, but actually aren't. You ever heard somebody quote the Bible by quoting what's really actually not in the Bible? Of course you have. In fact, you've heard so much of this. I want to start a sentence out loud, and I'm sure that you can complete this sentence out loud. These are Bible verses that people think are in the Bible, but they're not. People say, God helps those who help themselves. Definitely not in the Bible, but how many times have you heard somebody say, I like the Bible says... How about this one? Spare the rod, spoil the, the child. Not in the Bible. Proverbs 13, it's not what it's saying at all. It's very different, actually. How about this one? God won't give you more than you can. Have you read the book of Job ever in the Bible? So let's do the math. Here's the math. The Bible is the most distributed book ever. It's the most unread book ever. And it's the most misquoted book ever. That begs the question. Here's the question. What standards are people using to build this thing called their lives? What standard are we using? And the truth is, I believe we use a mix of standards, a quasi-understanding of Scripture and things that aren't Scripture. We think you're Scripture, but then also a lot of stuff just in the culture around us. Somebody once said, our, our, our life is a direct reflection of the voices that we listen to. Researchers say that the average cell phone user checks their cell phone 150 times a day. Some of you are like, that sounds like a low number. In fact, I'm just going to throw this out there. Look this up. I saw it this week. Haunting. If we had more time, it'd be on screen. A photographer took a bunch of photos around the world of people with their cell phones, and he removed the cell phones. People laying in bed next to each other. Families around the table at dinner in a restaurant. 150 times a day we pick up this phone. The average person receives 120 emails a day. And if you're the one sending them, I'm sorry, I haven't gotten back to you. The average person receives 32 text messages a day. Some of you are like, 32? Who gets that many? Some of you are like, 32? I wish I only got 32. I got 32 from my sister. The average person spends 50 minutes a day on Facebook. So here's the bottom line. According to media researchers, each and every one of us takes in 74 gigs of media input every day. Where are, we, what are the, where are we getting the standards by which we build this thing called our lives, our families? More often than not, from around us. Yale theologian Miroslav Volf asked the perfect question. We're going to put it on the screen. Here's the question. He said, perhaps the most important question is not whether our lives are tuned well, but what tuning fork we use. So like the, the, the Vasa worship, if we build our lives according to two different incompatible standards, God's word and a mix of just stuff from around us, we're setting ourselves up to be a tragedy in the making. And God's people in Nehemiah 8 found themselves at exactly that fork in the road. So where are we at? Let's get caught up on the story of Nehemiah as we get to chapter 8. God calls this guy Nehemiah to go rebuild the broken walls of Jerusalem. Then the people of Jerusalem rally around him. And they overcome all kinds of opposition, as we've seen. There's external opposition, internal opposition. And they rebuild the walls and complete the project in 52 days. In fact, Nehemiah 6, verses 15 and 16, says, And we completed the project in 52 days with the help of our God. So that's where we find ourselves at the end of chapter 6. The wall's been rebuilt. Then chapter 7, the people are then well-ordered and protected. Awesome. 
And then that brings us to chapter 8. When we get to chapter 8, the city is full of nice homes. People have great jobs. And there's excellent security. But something's missing. Does this sound familiar to anybody? City full of nice homes where people have great jobs and there's excellent security like the gates in our neighborhoods. And yet something is missing. And so the material need of the city has been addressed. But the spiritual need is just now coming into focus in Nehemiah chapter 8. So Nehemiah, and he gets his buddy Ezra from the book of Ezra, they team up. And they place God's word right at the very center of life in the city and in the community. Why are they doing that? Here's why. So that God can rebuild each heart because his word is at the center. And if he can re rebuild each heart, then he can rebuild each family. If he can rebuild each family, he can rebuild each neighbor. And if he can rebuild each neighbor, he can rebuild his, the city and the whole entire community. So we're talking today about being rebuilt by the Bible. So if you're a note taker, I want you to write this down. It's from Nehemiah chapter 8. We are rebuilt by the Bible, number one, as we read God's word. I know it sounds kind of like, way out there, but as we read God's word. By show of hands, how many of you ever heard that statement? You are what you eat. Don't you just love that statement? In other words, the, our, our physical body is like a direct reflection of the diet that we actually consume. Flip it around the other way. Loss of appetite. Physically, to have a loss of appetite for food is not a sign of physical health. It's actually a signal that we're not well. Here's a question. How can I check my spiritual health? Answer, just look at my spiritual appetite. A loss of appetite for God's word is not a good sign of spiritual well-being or spiritual health. It all comes down to one word. It's the word hunger. Everybody say hunger. It all comes down to hunger. My spiritual hunger is a direct reflection of my spiritual health. So in order to have rebuilt lives, first of all, we need to have revived hunger. Hunger, Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 1. And all the people gathered as one man at the square, which was in front of the water gate. And they asked Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Notice those two words there. They asked. They asked. And they get the whole community of God's people gathers together as a community, right there in the middle of town in public, and they asked. They asked Ezra to bring the book. Now, this phrase, the book, occurs five times in Nehemiah chapter 8. Now, there are only 18 verses, and the book occurs five different times. This chapter is all about the book. Scholars agree when they say the book, they're referring to the Torah, the law of Moses, the first five books in, in our Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. It's what's happening. Here's what's happening. God's people hunger for God's word. They're like, bring the book, bring the book. Break. That's the gathering that's happening. And, and Ezra's like, all right. This is a really good sign, don't you think? I mean, after all, isn't it, wasn't it Jesus who said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God? Matthew 4, 4. So according to Jesus, as bread for the body, God's word for the soul. In fact, Scripture even goes on to say that, that Scripture's like milk that feeds our new life in Christ, 1 Peter 2, 2. Scripture is like solid food that can make us strong to maturity, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. And so my favorite missionary theologian, his name is James Edward Leslie Newbegin. Long name, and he didn't deserve it. Leslie Newbegin wrote these words. I want you to see it. He said, it is less important to ask a Christian what he or she believes about the Bible than it is to inquire what he or she believes does with it. Don't ask me what I believe about the Bible. Just look at what I do with it. I'm not going to ask you your beliefs of the Bible. It's going to watch you and your Bible. So the question is, what are we supposed to do with the book? The answer, read it. Feed your soul on it. Now, here's a little news flash. I don't know if it's ever connected for you, but whatever you feed on, you grow an appetite for. Whatever it is, Twinkies or God's Word, whatever you feed on, you grow and nurture an appetite for. Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 2. Let's continue. 
Then Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men and women and all who could listen with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. He read from it before the square, which was in front of the water gate, from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and women, those who could understand. And all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Ezra the scribe stood at a, a wooden podium, which they made for the purpose. And beside him stood Mattathiah, Shema, Aniah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Maaseah on his right hand, and Pediah, Mishael, Malchijah, Hashum, the guy with a really cool name, and then Zechariah, and Mishalom on his left hand. I want you to notice in verse 3 that little word, read. He read. He just read. Now picture the scene. Ezra's standing at a podium, a big wooden one. He's, he's standing at a podium, and he's reading God's word out loud. Scholars estimate there's about 50,000 men, women, and children gathered there, all who could at least understand. And they're listening attentively as Ezra reads the book of the law from early morning to midday. That's at least five hours. We can't get people in churches to stand for more than two songs. And these people are out there for five hours, at least, standing and listening to the word of God being read. Why are they doing this? Here's why. They're hungry for God. They have a hunger. They have had their fill of their own way, of their own thing, and their own standards. And they just rebuilt a city full of brokenness and emptiness of doing those very things. And they had had enough of that. And now they want God's way. Have you ever come to that place in your life? I've had enough of my way, God. I've had enough of me being the standard. I've had enough of the brokenness and emptiness that comes from me being at the middle. You get in the middle. You take over. I want your word. I want what you say. I want your voice to dominate my life. That's where they found themselves. And it all comes down to the key, my friends. Hunger. Hunger, hunger, hunger. Study after study reveals that the number one factor of spiritual growth in the life of a Christian, number one factor, number one factor, is called Bible engagement. I want to introduce it to you right now. And I'm going to quote four studies for you, four. I can, we can go on and on all day long. These are actual studies of real research and real actual validated information. The first study is Willow Creek's Reveal Study from 2004. The second study is Lifeway's Life Transformational Discipleship Study of 2011. And then the next one is the Barna State of the Bible Study in 2019. And then the fourth one is the Center for Bible Engagement Study. They all say the same thing. The number one thing that transforms the life of a Christian over time, number one, Bible engagement. What's Bible engagement? Well, here's a definition. I'll put it up on the screen. Here it is. Bible engagement is the ongoing habit of picking up the Bible no less than four times a week to continue reading it through in a systematic way. We're not talking about Bible study. Not at all. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about reading the Bible. Reading the Bible. That's all we're talking about. In fact, let's hone in a little bit. The Center for Bible Engagement studied the lives of 400 thousand Christians around the world. I'm a researcher. When I hear 400,000 as a data set, I'm like, woo, that's a good data set. Here's their number one conclusion we're going to put up on the screen. A key discovery from the Center for Bible Engagement Research is that the life of someone who engages Scripture four or more times a week looks radically different from the life of someone who does not. In fact, the lives of Christians who do not engage the Bible most days of the week are statistically the same as the lives of non-believers. This is research. Facts are our friends. This is true. What good is having a Bible if you don't read it? And if you do read it, and all you do is read it, and you don't stop reading it, your life will never be the same. Let me ask you, do you hunger? Do you hunger for God's word? Then read it. Just feed your, day, your, feed your soul. Look at it this way. 2 Timothy 3.16 says that the scriptures breathed out by God. All scriptures breathed out by God. First, or 2 Peter 1.21 says it was the spirit who breathed out the scripture. Listen. If the spirit breathed out the book 
When you're reading it, you're breathing in the life breath of God. So not having it, something like Bible engagement where we're opening the book four times at least a week, that's like, <gasps> it's like holding our breath. No wonder there are so many blue-faced Christians who are just passing out all over. We are not breathing in what the Spirit breathed out because we're just not taking time to pick the book up, read it, and let God breathe life into us. Dr. Ron Rhodes summarized what so many studies confirm. Here it is. Your continuous revival hinges on your continuous exposure to God's Word. The Spirit wrote the book. If you read the book, the Spirit breathes into you. So we are rebuilt by the Bible, first of all. Number one, as you read God's Word, we got that one. Second of all, we are rebuilt by the Bible as we revere. As we revere. And we're talking about worshiping the book. The Word of God is about the God of the Word, not pages and paper. Years ago, a friend of mine created one of the first ever, like seriously, it's like almost 30 years ago, one of the first ever searchable online Bibles where you could like do, it was really cool. And so when he showed it to me, I was like, wow, why did you do this? Like, give me the vision. Here's what he said. He said, um, when we treat the Bible like any other data source, we can index it and then we can search it. And I just got to tell you, it kind of, he's a, I love the guy, great dude, great heart, but it kind of troubled me a little bit to hear the Bible referred to, God's word referred to as like any other data source, we can index it and church it. Here's a little newsflash. The Bible is not, just like any other data source, we can index it and search it. The Bible is not informational in character. It's relational in character. The goal of the Bible is to reveal to us God as he really is, and what it looks like to live rightly under God, to know his ways and to walk with this God. So friends, this goal of the Bible is special. It's sacred. It is to be revered. So when God's people heard God's word on that day, they revered it in two ways. First of all, they, showed they, they revered it by standing under it. By standing under it. Notice verses 5 and 6. Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while they were lifting up their hands. Then they bowed low and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Notice that statement there. All the people stood up. Why did they stand up? To show honor to demonstrate reverence for God's word. Why would they do that? Well, here's why. Because two times it says opened, opened, opened. They believe that when we open the book, God opens his mouth in an authoritative sense. And so what do they do? They revere the word. They're like, this isn't just thoughts of a person. This is the very words of God. These are the very thoughts of God, the very character and heart of God made known to us, the very will and ways of God made known to us, the Lord, the great God. Now listen, there's so many Christians, they're willing to spend their time, effort, and energy to defend the Bible as the Word of God, but we don't revere the Bible as the Word of God in the way that we treat it. I'm not talking about don't send anything over your Bible. We're not talking about that. We're talking about recognizing the relational character of this book and not an informational character. To revere is to be deeply affected by something, to allow it to strike you deep. There are all kinds of signs of reverence here. Verse 6, they called out loud voices, amen, amen, which is pretty cool. I dig that. Second thing, they had their hands lifted up. Now you've got to understand, when Jews lift up their hands, we kind of do it this way, like, surrender. That's not how they do it. They do it this way. They lift their hands to receive. They're not given as much as they're there to receive. They're to, to get God to speak in ways, and so he, give it to me, Lord. And then also we see they revere God's word because they bow their faces to the ground. In other words, they were deeply affected. To revere is to allow something to deeply affect you at the deepest part of who you are. Here's a question. Am I under God's word? Is my marriage under God's word? Is your, are you under God's word? God's word? 
for many of us, we look into our lives and we, we were like, man, I wish God would just breathe new life into my marriage or into my family and with my kids or my friendships or just into me. We just want God to breathe. So listen, how does he do it? First, let me quote. Todd Bishop said these words. I want you to see them. Here it is. He said, a dead battery can't jump another dead battery. You want God to pour out a spirit on your family? Awesome. Get under the word. You, get under the word. Then he can pour it out through you into the marriage. Don't expect God to pour out a spirit on the marriage. That pour out on you. Get under the word. Bring your kids under the word. Bring your family under the word. Your business, your team. Bring your relationships under the word. When you get under the word, then it can flow through you out to other people. How do they revere God's word? First of all, by standing under it. Second of all, by understanding it. It takes work. And when we put it, we do reverential work to understand this. And so verses 7 and 8, there's a whole bunch of names. I'll just try to read them because that's kind of fun. And also Jeshua, Jeshua, Bani, Sarabiah, Jamin, Akub, Sebathai, Hodiah, Measiah, Kalida, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, Peliah. Okay, who are they? They're the Levites. The Levites explained the law to the people while the people remained in their place. They read from the book, from the law of God, translating to give the sense so that they understood the meaning. Now notice that word there, understood. In Nehemiah chapter 8, the word understanding or understood occurs six times. So again, the book, five times. Understanding, six times. And so here we have a mixed group, men, women, children of different ages, all coming to a shared understanding of God's word together. That's a sacred place. How'd they get there? Two people put in the work. Two groups. The Levites put in some work and the people put in the work. So the Levites, what did they do? They circled up the people in groups. So picture, this is literally what's happening in, in Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah is reading the law. The Levites are dispersed out in the crowd of 50,000. And they circle up groups of people. He would read and they would be like, okay, hold on. And they would circle up and do a small group. And they would explain it and the people would dig in. How cool is that to do sermon and small groups in the same room at the same time? It's like point number one. Okay, cool. Wait, hold on. All right, point number one. What do you got? Where are we at here? What do you, you don't understand? Let's talk about that. How about you? Where are you? Where am I? All right, good. Next. And then that's what they were doing. So the leaders did their part, but then the people did their part. What was their part? The text is to remain in place. We're not going anywhere. We're going to circle up. We want to understand. We want to know. And so they participated. Tell me that's not what reverence looks like. We want to know. We're not going anywhere. Leaders lead us into knowing, and we will participate in knowing together so we can all arrive at a shared understanding of the will and ways of our Father. Dr. Warren Wearsby summarizes it perfectly. He says, The Spirit of God uses the Word of God to cleanse and revive the hearts of the people of God. That's what being deeply affected looks like. So, so we, we are rebuilt by the Bible as we, number one, read God's Word, Number two, as we revere God's word. And number three, as we respond to God's word. As we respond to God's word. Let me see your hand if you've ever gone into a store to buy a Bible before. You ever done that? You ever had this experience? You walk in, maybe it's a Christian store or whatever, and you go, oh, I'm going to buy a Bible. And you go over to the Bible section, and as soon as you see it, you see, boom, this wall full of all of these versions, types, names, and some are thick and some are thin, and some have, there's all these, and you're like, what's going on? How many Bibles are there? How many translations are out there? Well, here's a little news flash. There are approximately 900 different versions and translations of the Bible into the English language. Here's a question. Which one's the best? Here's the answer. It's called the doer's translation. Whatever one you're going to read and do, that's the best one. James 1.22 says, be not just hearers of the word, but be doers of the word. Not hearers only who deceive themselves. So as you read the Bible, here's what's going to happen. It's going to read you. As you read the Bible, it will read you back. And so if we do this, what can we expect to respond? What can we expect? Three things. First of all, expect conviction. Verse 9. Expect conviction. Then Nehemiah, who is the governor, and Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites, there's team ministry right there, who taught the people, 
said to all the people, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people were weeping when they heard the words of the law. You see the words there, mourn, and the word weeping, weeps occurs a couple times. Why, why are they weeping? Here's why they're weeping. They hadn't heard God's word for a generation. They literally were in exile. They lost the book. They didn't have the book. And so when finally the book is open and the words are read, they're struck at their core because they're hearing about how good God is and how good God has been and how not good they are and how not good they have been. And they were struck deep. Here's some bad news, friends. Sometimes the truth hurts. God's word confronts us before it comforts us. Here's the good news. It's the crisis of confrontation that initiates the process of transformation. It all begins with a confrontation. Dr. Adrian Rogers said it best. He said, the devil will bring you down and keep you there. The Holy Spirit will bring you down to lift you even higher. What can I expect if I'm going to respond? If I'm going to read this thing, what can I expect? Number one, expect conviction, but expect conviction to drive you to the second thing that's worship. Worship. Notice verses 10 through 12. Then he said to them, go, eat of the fat, drink of the sweet. Now the Bible says, go eat of the fat and drink of the sweet. Praise God for the Bible, right? <laughs> there it is. And send portions to him who has nothing prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not be grieved. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be still, for the day is holy, and do not be grieved. And all the people went away to eat and drink and send portions and to celebrate a great festival because they understood the words which had been made known to them. Notice that statement there, the joy of the Lord is your strength. What's the opposite of strength? Weakness. When you open the book and you're confronted with, you see how, how we fail. Often we could just feel like, oh. So we're just confronted with this sense of, man, look at how many ways I fail. But here's the thing. God's word produces mourning so that it can produce joy. It shows us our failure so it can show us God's forgiveness. So the conviction should drive us to the God who forgives. Here's a Bible verse for you. Nehemiah 9.17. It's next week. But you can slide over there a little later and read it. In the midst of just their horrible behavior, God is called the God of forgiveness and compassion. So they're driven to worship. What's worship? Worship is seeing God for who he revealed himself to be in Scripture and then responding with joy. So, so notice what's happening. If you open the book, what's going to happen? First of all, expect conviction. But second of all, expect that conviction to drive you to worship. Then third of all, expect worship to drive you to number three, obedience. Nehemiah 8 and verse 14. They found written in the law how the Lord had commanded through Moses that the sons of Israel should live in booths during the, seven, uh, the feast of the seventh month, which is the month that they were just about in. Notice verse 17. The entire assembly of those who had returned from the captivity made booths and lived in them. The sons of Israel had indeed not done so from the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, to that day. And there was great rejoicing. What's going on right here? So here's what's going on. Verses 13 through 18, God's people found out by hearing the word that they had not obeyed the Feast of Tabernacles, spelled out in Leviticus 23, 39 through 40. Seven days, the Israelites, and it was coming right up, seven days, they're supposed to move out of their house into the yard build temporary shelters out of branches and live in that for a week with your kids. You're like, it's, it's, why, why would we do that? Every generation was to be reminded, this is how your forefathers lived for 40 years in the wilderness because they disobeyed God. They weren't in the promised land. They were in the desert of disobedience and never forget what it was like to live in a desert of disobedience. The key was in verse 17. It says that the entire assembly, they all went out and they made booths and lived in them. Here's, what this means. Here's what's going on. Every family had to figure out how to obey that. What does a booth look like? I don't know. Hey, kids, we need branches. Okay. So every family had to figure it out for themselves, what it looks like for them to obey God. And so do you. 
Every family has to figure it out for themselves what it looks like for you to obey God. And when they did, when they did, the text says, there was great rejoicing. You want God to breathe life back into your family, get his word in the middle. You want God to breathe life back in your marriage, get his word in the middle. I want you to notice the flow of response here. Conviction drives us to worship. Worship results in obedience. Obedience brings great joy. Do you see it? Do you see it? There's a word for all that. It's revival. Dr. Reverend David Legge put it this way. He said, do you want to be revived? You need to revive reading this book. You need to recognize the meaning of this book. And you need to respond in obedience to this book. You go, man, I get it. I want it. Where do we begin? Here's where we begin. Bible engagement. Here at the Brook, today marks the beginning of what we are calling our 21-day Bible experience. It starts today. So we're inviting you to join the 21-day Bible reading experience. We're not going to read the whole Bible. We're just going to read the Gospel of John. John has 21 chapters. If you read one chapter a day in 21 days, you've finished the, the Gospel of John. So today's day one. And so when you walk out today, you're going to get this Bible plan. Or you can see the link on the screen, click on it, and you'll see. This is our Bible plan. 21 days, it's a chapter a day. It's like seven minutes, it's easy to do. So here's what we're going to say. Number one, commit to it. Say, I want to do it. So you can go online, the little QR code, you can click a link. Here's why we want you to put your name in. Because our leaders here, at the brook are gonna pray for you for those 21 days. We can't pray for you if you don't put your name in there. So we're praying for the names. Give us your name, we wanna pray for you as you read. So number one, sign up. Number two, just just commit to doing the thing, read a day. And I want you also, the third thing, pick a partner. Pick a reading partner. If you're married, your partner is the one you're gonna read with, That's, that's who. If you have kids, say, okay, we're doing it as a family. You do it in the morning, how about right after dinner, every night, 21 days, it's not too hard. I we raised our kids doing this, just simply reading. You don't have to be a scholar. You don't have to explain everything. Just simply read it. So if you, if you, when you leave today, you'll get the plan. It tells you exactly what to do, but we need you to commit. And we want you to let us know because we want to pray for you. This is a shared journey we're all going to do together. Each home figuring out what it looks like for you to partner up to read God's word for 21 days. Why would I do it? Well, I want you to listen to this story from my friend Stefan Reed. Stefan is a pastor at, uh, he's on staff at the largest church in the United States. You don't know they're the largest because they don't want to be known that way. 35 campuses, 100,000 physical attendees, 300,000 people a weekend watch online. And he's one of their pastors, and I used to work there. And God gave me a season of, of, of influence in the lives of many of their pastors. So a year ago, almost a year ago now, Stefan posted this on Facebook. I want to show you the post. We'll put it up on the screen. You can't read it off the screen, but I want you to see the picture that he posted as I read this. Stefan Reed, I read through my Bible for the first time when I was challenged by Pastor Jim Botts, who said, I don't think much of a pastor who hasn't read through the Bible. It hit me like a brick. Not only as a pastor, but as a follower of Christ. I hadn't read the entire story of my Savior. That set me on a path to read the entire Word of God every year after that. What started out as a fresh reading plan and a new Bible, 11 years later, is now a tattered guide and a Bible held together by duct tape. It's been the greatest joy of my spiritual life, getting to know Jesus by reading the Bible. Thank you, Pastor Jim Boss, for pushing me to grow. There's always a sense of wonder and amazement sprinkled with a sense of accomplishment every time I finish the Lord's book. If you haven't read through the Bible, what are you waiting for? Everything you've ever wanted to know about God and life and challenges and joy, hardship, celebrations, growth, learning, are locked inside of the Word. You won't get those secrets for free. you got to read and earn it. But once you do, I promise your life and your relationship with Christ will be richer and fuller because of it. Start a reading plan. Pick up your Bible. Get to work. You won't be disappointed. Enjoy the journey. Journey indeed. And it's a journey we want to share as a family and as church family. So, 21 Day Journey begins today. Will you pray with me? Father, we are grateful that you are the God who reveals yourself. When we open the scriptures, there you are. 
spelling out your goodness and your greatness and your mercy and your will and your ways. And we encounter you and we just say, thank you, God, for breathing life into us through your word that was written and empowered by your spirit that reveals to us on every page the glories of your son, our redeemer, Jesus. And our prayer today, God, will you, will you empower us to share a journey of getting around your word and engaging together with heads bowed and eyes closed. If you're here today and you're a follower of Jesus, part of the Brook family or maybe part of our online family, here's the challenge. Will you do the 21-day journey today? Will you sign up? Not just in your heart saying, yeah, I'll do it, but saying, no, no, I'm gonna put in my name down. And I'm, when I do that little form, I click on that, I'm just gonna put the name of my partner, my family, so that others can pray for me so that we can have a shared journey. If you're here today and you are a Christian, you say, I want God to breathe new life into my life. It's gonna require revived appetite for God's word. And so, I wanna pray for you. Father, I pray for every one of your people right now who say, I need this. I need you to breathe new life into me, my relationships, my decision making. Empower me as I open this book each day. Show me who my partner should be. If, if, if I don't have a family member, who, is it a friend, coworker? Who, who should I invite on this journey to read with me? Father, our prayer is that as we do, you would just breathe new life into every part of our lives as we continue praying today. There are some of you here today, and the truth is, uh, as Jesus said, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that could. There's some of you, you have been living by bread alone. You've been living by anything material you can get your hands on, and the result, emptiness, and maybe even brokenness. And you find yourself today going, I want to know God. I recognize that I'm, something's not right between me and God, and I want it to be right. I want to know this God. Listen, this God loves you so much. He sent Jesus into this world to do for you what you could never do for himself. First of all, he lived the perfect life you could never live, and he offered that obedience to God on your behalf. Second of all, he offered a perfect sacrifice for all of our sins, yours included, on that cross, so that as he died, your sins go in the grave with him. Three days later, he rose from the grave and offering newness of life and his very own spirit to come and indwell all who call upon him. And maybe you're at a place today, you're going, you know what? I've had enough of my own way. I've had enough of being my own standard. I feel my life tipping over and sinking even now. I wanna know God. I wanna call upon Jesus. You could do it, it's as simple as A, B, C. Admit you need him. Be, believe on him, see, call upon him. We can do it right here and now and say, dear God, I am a sinner and I do need a savior. And Jesus, right now, I believe you are the son of God and you died on the cross for me. And right now I call on you and I ask you to forgive all my sins, to come into my life, fill me with your spirit and begin to rebuild me right now, beginning today. Thank you for giving your life for me. And right now, best I know how I give my life back to you. And I say, I want you to be my leader, my savior, my healer, my redeemer. From this moment on, I follow you. It's in your name that I pray. And everybody said, amen. Well, that's you, man. I just want to say welcome to God's family. Welcome also to your Brook family. And here, as, as a spiritual family, we want to journey with you. And here's how we can journey with you. If you're new to a relationship with Christ, like maybe like right now, awesome. Join the 21-day journey. That's all you have to do. Just click on that 21-day journey and say, you know what? I want to do that. I want to read the Gospel of John 21 days. Just pick a friend, read with them, and just follow along with the instructions of the plan. Because here's what's going to happen. God is going to revive your life. He's going to breathe new life. And he's going to rebuild you day by day, brick by brick, moment by moment. Because that's who he is. That's what he does. He's the God who rebuilds. And the end game is for you to go from ruinous to glorious. So let's celebrate this God.